Good morning. Go over our announcements real quick this morning. Uh, one of the biggest things you can see, Bible school is almost here. Got a lot of work yet to be done. Uh, some ladies come up here working all the time, putting this stuff together. Uh, we need help, teachers, need food, all that stuff to sign up sheet in the foyer. So I'll talk to Miss Dawn. She'll, she'll draft you if you're not careful. Uh, after Bible school, you know, the Sunday after that, we got uh, the Southern Plainsman's going to be here for the concert that morning. And then uh, the bridge, I have the Sunday night service. It's going to be a special night with them. The, uh, on June the 5th, before the Bible school starts, we're going to have another work day. It's a lot of work that needs to be done around here. The last day, we didn't get it all completed. So there's some more stuff that needs to be done. So show up for that day. That's all, by the way. Roxy, you had something about the Secret Sisters? Uh, yes. While they're getting ready, there's some of these Plainsmen things on the welcome table that you can take to put on storefronts or your office or things like that. They're out there as well. Am I the only one that thinks Roxy and Dawn need to show all of us how to do that? <laughs> Let's all stand together. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. For purple mountain majesty. 
tasty Above the fruited plain America, America God shed His grace on thee From sea to shining sea, oh beautiful for heroes sprint in liberating strife, who more than self their country love and mercy more than love. God shed His grace on thee, till all six with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for patriot dreams that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities clean, undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed His grace on thee. I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. Sing that again. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my Land of the pilgrim's pride From every mountain side Let freedom ring Our fathers, God, to thee Author of liberty To thee we sing Long may Freedom's holy light Protect us by thy might Great God our King Y'all have a seat. Thirteen folds. Each fold a reminder of a life spent in service. Service to country, service to people, protecting God-given rights, preserving freedoms. 
13 folds. At each fold, we remember the friends and family left behind. The mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters left to pick up the pieces. 13 folds. And we remember the scriptures. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Each one loved greatly. We also remember that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we pray, God be near those who need comfort. So, draw close to those who mourn. Make your presence and appreciation known. Let this church be a safe place, a comforting place. And let us honor those who have given their lives in service to this country. Thirteen folds to signify a life given to service. Amen. Well, that's what we remember today on this Lord's Day. We come to the, to the house of the Lord to, to remember those who've given that ultimate sacrifice, that ultimate price, to give us the freedoms that we know today. I think about this day, and it's become so controversial today to, to, uh, for the church to even sometimes uh, celebrate uh, political days, war days, uh, days like Memorial Day and Veterans Day or July the 4th. And, uh, and, and I think we really miss an opportunity to show how, how much God had to do with the founding of this nation. I will tell you, had, our, had many of the founding fathers not been as deeply spiritual people as they were, when this country was founded, it would have been a different country than it is today. About two-thirds of the laws of our land come directly from things mentioned in the Scripture. Uh, the Bible was the most quoted thing used by the founders when they were there debating in the Constitutional Congress and, and writing the Constitution and all that was done. And the Bible was what was often quoted and, uh, and used in many of those instances. And so... But if you attend a liberal university today, a real liberal university, they'll tell you, oh, no, God didn't have anything to do with the founding of this nation. In fact, law schools use a book called The Godless Constitution. Well, that's pretty stupid to read that and realize it. it the Constitution talks about how we were created equal. If it doesn't say anything else, there's God right there. Created, using the word created. And so, time and time again, we see the hand of God in the founding of this nation. Now, God's not in this this poster people put up here with my face on it, God's not in that, you know. Uh, you know. Somebody said, why did a preacher's face wind up on Mount Rushmore? I said, because I was the hardest head they could find in America. <laughs> and that may be true, I'm not sure. That may be why they put me on there, but, you know, I'm not even sure who did that. But let me just say I owe them something, all right. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Only because you don't have the technical know-how. That's the only reason I know you didn't do it. <laughs> you might have put it up, though, but I don't know who made it. But, uh, no, what a, what a week it is. I think we can pause, and we're not here today to say America's greater than God. We're here today to say America's part of the fruits of God. Yes, has America had its faults? Yeah, we've had our faults. But just like you've had your faults, and we've all learned from the faults of our nation, and we've grown from those faults. So we're not here today to say America was always perfect. It took us a while to kind of get all of our thinking together. But uh, listen, let me share this with you. I read this this week from a Gary Brown. It said this, remembering the lost. It says, we don't know them all, but we owe them all. Another anonymous quote said, uh, I, I say this, we celebrate the holiday knowing that there are those who would question the use of that term. Memorial Day is a solemn occasion 
they would argue. It honors men and women who gave their lives while serving in the military, and we shouldn't celebrate death, they say. No, but we should observe this holiday and recognize the sacrifices made by so many. We can, what we can and should celebrate, however, is the bravery uh, in going to battle for our freedoms. Another anonymous quote said this, succinctly, said, it succinctly defined the nature of freedom and pays tribute to those who earn it by only sliding, alter, slightly altering words in our national anthem, home of the free because of the brave. Few soldiers and sailors and aviators and others in the military head off to war seeking to, to show their bravery by making the ultimate sacrifice, paying for our freedoms with their lives. Most are aware, however, that death is a cost they might have to bear, and they are willing to pay the price, if necessary, fighting for freedom with their final breaths, for they know that the struggle so often is imperative. No man is entitled to the blessings of freedom unless he be vigilant in its preservation, said Douglas, General Douglas MacArthur. Another general, more recent leader, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, said, uh, recognized the true nature of, of heroism. And uh, he said, it doesn't take a hero to order men into battle, he said. It takes a hero to be one of those men who goes into battle. But this is not a one-time risk of life. Freedom earned is a is not freedom necessarily guaranteed, said President Ronald Reagan. Seems like we have to go back and fight that battle for freedom over and over again, don't we? Just like even in our convention sometimes, we have to go back and fight that battle to stay with truth, to stay with truth, not get off the road. And so uh, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction, President uh, Reagan said. We did not pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Another president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the man who led America through, the most, through most of World War II, knew the danger of forgetting the price of freedom. He said, those who have long enjoyed such privileges, privileges as we, he said, forget in time that men have died to win them. It's amazing to me today, the people who want to run up and down the streets and riot and burn things down, hate the military and hate the police, and at the same time, they don't realize it's the military and the police that gave them the freedom to run up and down that street that other countries don't have. If that offends you, uh, you can come up to me afterwards and apologize, and I'll forgive you. All right. Yet another anonymous quotation cautions against allowing the lapse of memory in memory to occur. It cites the importance of annually having a date on which we turn our attention toward individuals in our past whose absence now might otherwise make it easy for us to forget them. Memorial Day. We ought to celebrate it, honor it, and remember it whenever we come together. We can proudly fly our flags on Memorial Day and not and not be offensive to God. God gave us this great nation. <clears throat> we can wave them during parades. We can wear them as pins on our lapels on holidays. We can place them as patriotic background for our social media photos. Following memorial services, we can enthusiastically celebrate the holiday with all the sporting events, family affairs, so that uh, that so ex exemplify a free America kicking loose on a three-day holiday. Still, we should remember then and recognize that this freedom was earned not, and, and later preserved by those whose graves are decorated by flags on this day. Their lives and their loss are symbolized by each stripe and star on those flags. I believe our flag is more than just cloth and ink said Senator John Thune of South Dakota. He went on to say, It's a universally recognized symbol that stands for liberty and freedom. It's the history of our nation. It's marked by the blood of those who died defending it, was what Gary Brown shared in a, an article he wrote, and I thought that was a good article for us to remember. 
So yes, that flag, some people say they died for their flag, and they did, but they died for what that flag stands for. It stands for freedom. And so we're grateful for that today. If you are here today and you lost a loved one, sometime in some war, some of you here are old enough maybe have lost a loved one in the Civil War. I'm not sure. Some of you have been here a while, so I don't know. But, uh, but if you've lost a loved one in a military encounter, uh, we thank you for your sacrifice and, uh, and what your family has given and we'll say a little bit more about that sacrifice in, in a little while. But uh, if you've lost someone in the military uh, down through the years, could, I, could we see your hand? Just hold your hand up. Several hands here, folks all over. Well, we do want to remember you, thank, be thankful for you this morning. So we pause now just with a prayer to say thank you, Lord. And we're not doing all, recognizing all the branches of the military today. We're going, that's a Veterans Day. We're going to do that special for a separate day. And today is the day we remember uh, those who have given that ultimate sacrifice in death. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful here today. We saw the hands go up, Lord. We, we know the prices that were paid, the, the losses that were felt. Whether that loss be grandparents, great-grandparents, parents, children, brothers or sisters, whatever it may have been, Lord, we are today moved by the fact that some would literally go out there and stand between us and evil and pay that ultimate sacrifice of death. Lord, help us to be appreciative of that. Help us to be grateful for that. And uh, Lord, today we are. And we as a group, a church here today, says thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed our nation. And God, when you didn't have to, because we sure have not been perfect. But God, we pray that our nation would again bring honor and glory to you. That God, we might turn our faces back to you. That we might be grateful. God, that we might preserve this freedom. That we might not lose it or give it up as some would have us do today. Lord, may this people always understand that, yes, freedom as a nation is one thing, but Lord, we know that also that we can know the truth, and that truth will set us free. And that ultimate, eternal, spiritual truth is found in Jesus Christ. And so today we thank you for his price that he paid, and we thank you for those that paid a great price for our freedom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come thy fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming Tongues above, praise thy mount, I fix upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when. Your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Come thy King, come thy precious Prince of Peace, hear your bride to you we sing, come thy fount of our blessing. Y'all stand with us. 
Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thine goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prong to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prong to lead the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above Prong to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prong to lead the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of love. You make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise. To shake prison walls, I will speak to my fears, I will preach to my doubt. You are faithful then, you'll be faithful now. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now, cause you make mountains move. You make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fears, I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. You were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Y'all have a seat. As I journeyed through his precious word, I find where Adam fell and lost our soul. Rescued my soul from Adam. 
eternal life for his blood has been applied he placed it on the mercy Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, amen. If I could sing like that, I'd just sing my sermons. Amen? I would sing my sermons if I could do that. I found out some terrible advice, some, some information recently. I found out that Daniel Altenberry made these pictures and put them up all around church. My friend. My oldest friend in this church, except my mama. Nobody knows how hard-headed I am better than Daniel. Amen. And Miss Dawn. Don't forget, we have all these registration forms for Bible school, which starts next Sunday night, if you didn't remember that. It goes through Wednesday night, 5.30 to 8 o'clock. And uh, Miss Dawn still needs people to sign up to lead groups around. She's got all her main teachers and stuff like that, but she needs some helpers. And so uh, please see her about that. And if you'll get your children, go ahead and pick up one of these forms today and get it filled out. Bring it back already filled out next Sunday morning. It sure speeds things up Sunday night, so we're not trying to register all the children. So you do that this next week. Don't forget our, our, our giving boxes you know we stopped when we stopped during the covid we we stopped uh, collecting the offering plates just from passing them to one person to the next and concerned about germs and passing the sickness or whatever and and to be honest with you when we and thanks to mike Merritt, he built these offering boxes by the doors and to be honest we didn't know how that would work we didn't know whether the offerings were going to drop off terribly and anything but i want you to know it's like god has just proven that it if people want to give they want to give and if it, it hadn't we hadn't dropped off at all it may have gotten better and uh it's just amazing that god is meeting our needs but but we do want to be faithful you know why i want you to be faithful to give because i want you to be faithfully blessed you know i, I mean that i mean that i believe god's got plenty of money to do the things he wants to do whether we give or not but uh, he can do whatever, and, uh, but I believe it is important that we are obedient and we're faithful. I'll be in 2 Timothy. The children are ready for children's church, so let's let them go out at this time. The parents are ready, whether the children are ready or not. If you're looking for a place where you can help here in the church, children's church, children's department, those are places that you could get plugged in right away and be a part of our children's ministry there's always needs there and that group just seems to be the fastest growing group in the church and so they are uh, 
there's always a need for help in those areas. And so in children's church, but also in Sunday school and like we've said, vacation Bible school. Today I want to tie in Memorial Day with, with service for the Lord and what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. 2 Timothy, would you stand with me and let's read that? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Did you know that God's Word compares living the Christian life to being a soldier? Did you know that? You, many of you have heard this verse before, but let's read them again. Three verses there. Verse 3. It says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And so, think about this, particularly those first two verses as they talk about uh, the service of the Lord. And it's saying that our service for the Lord is much like... Uh, a soldier. Why does it say that? Because we are involved in spiritual warfare. There is a battle for the souls of men and women in the world. Did you know if you're here today and you're not saved, that the devil's doing all he can to battle to keep you unsaved? To keep us and the Lord and the Holy Spirit from wooing you into the family of God. And there's a battle for your soul. And today, we want to be reminded of that. And I want to say to all of you, thank you for being here today. This being a long weekend, a lot of times preachers think, you know, I've heard people say, oh, a long weekend this week. You'll be able to throw a hand grenade in our church and not hurt anybody. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you've, you've attended well this morning, and there's a lot of folks out. that are. There's a few folks that are gone. So thank you for being faithful uh, this morning. A real test for us is always summer. You know, can we be faithful to the things of God during the summer months? And let's pray. Father God, as we read these scriptures today, we are reminded, God, that we are in our service to you to, uh, to, to do as that soldier does, to, to learn of our enemy, to prepare to face that enemy, to overcome that enemy. And Lord, we know we serve, we serve you, our commander, but God, that there is an enemy and we need to know everything about that enemy, and we need to know how to overcome him. And we pray today you would help us to do that. Help us to learn how to be good soldiers of the cross. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen and amen. You know, if you were in World War II, and you were, say, a German, and you were fighting for the uh, the, the Nazi side of things, and if you ran up on some Americans... You would immediately identify them as the enemy. And you would, for lack of a better term, you would hate them. You'd be out to kill them because that's who you're trying to overcome. Same thing true if you were American and you ran upon that, that enemy. You would seek to defeat them. You would seek to overcome them. And, and you would make sure that's the case. But, but I want you to know today the same thing is true in spiritual warfare, the same thing is true today that we have an enemy, and not only is that enemy someone that we overcome should overcome, and he is the devil himself, and all of his minions, all of his demons, they are the enemy. They should be recognized as the enemy. There, we can't peacefully coexist with him. You know, just like you wouldn't see the Americans and Germans sitting down every, every evening after fighting all day long, having a meal together. You wouldn't see that. Uh, and, and you wouldn't see that today. We can't peacefully coexist. There's too many Christians today trying to peacefully coexist with the devil. Trying to just say, well, you know, I don't want to be a big problem. I don't want to, I'm just kind of going to go along with the culture. I'm going to, I was watching an amazing program Mom had taped last night on, uh, on uh, Brother David Barton, who's head, who runs Wall Builders, he and his son were on there, and they were talking about, they believe we may be heading into a great, a third awakening, a third revival stage, a third awakening that, that you know, and even some first great awakening and the second great awakening, they, they said there was still a lot of bad that went on. And, and there was a lot of, uh, uh, you'd think during the great awakening, well, just everything, all the bad died and all the good started. Well, no, that wasn't the case. In the midst of dark, dark days, 
there was a light that shined. And there was a growth in the church. And, uh, and I know that could happen today. But one of the things I was going to tell you they brought out last night was they did a survey of Christian pastors. And they found out in that survey of Christian pastors that 72% of them, Barna did, in a survey, 72% of them didn't agree with everything in the Bible. Hmm, hence, hence a lot of the problems we have in the church today. In the, when I say the church, I'm not necessarily talking about our church or even Baptists. I'm talking about the church nationally. He was saying there's like 300 and, 325, 330,000 churches in America. Did you know that? And of them, about 70% of them have drifted away from the Word of God. And so it only left about a little over 100,000, he said, that had been faithful, that were still faithful and believed every word of the Bible. I'd like to think most of them were, a lot of them were Southern Baptist. Uh, I'd like to think a lot of them were more conservative. Your, your churches, see many of the churches, many mainline denominations who at one time were believed the Word of God, they've drifted away. And what they've done is they've compromised with the devil to try to, to try to make their enemy like them better. And my friend, that'll never work. That'll never work. One of the things they brought out last night I thought was so unique was that we have to, uh, we have to draw the line. We have, to, we have to say what truth is, and we speak to truth. And one of the things they said in all of those, these first two great awakenings, and they believe now, is that one of the things that if, if revival and spiritual awakening was going to happen... There had to be a clear distinction of what God has said. A clear distinction of what is truth and that we cannot compromise on truth. And he says the spiritual awakening does not happen when we start compromising with the world. You have to draw a line that says here's what God says is right and here's what God says is wrong. And evidence of compromising with the world is how many churches today want to now say, well, you know... Uh, uh, there's several different types of gender. You know, you can be you can be a half a dozen different genders if you want to, and and we're not going to determine that. They said somebody said the other day. He said they they asked if uh, their baby was born and they were filling out the birth certificate, and they said, do you want to put a sex on there now, or do you want to wait a little later and let them determine what sex they want to be? Like what an idiot! You know how silly is that? We have just simply lost our mind. We are so confused about simple things. And these are simple things the Bible has spoken to. You know, it says God made them male and female. End of sentence. Amen? And no, he didn't say, and God made you male and female, and later on we'll let you decide what you want to be. You know, well, you can be number three, or you can be number four, whatever that is. And so... Here is where we must stand, and if we are heading toward that great third awakening, it's going to require the church to know what they believe, to know what their enemy believes. You know, a good soldier sees his enemy, and he knows what his enemy's doing. He tries to have a plan to take on what the enemy's doing. And it's important that we know that there's one out there who still kill, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's got a plan to bring you down. He's got a plan to destroy us. He's got a plan. He hates you and hates everything about you. And those who follow him today who, who, who are, are, have decided that, that if the Bible says it's good, they think there's got to be a different answer. That's where you get all this third gender stuff, by the way. The Bible says one thing, you say, well, I don't like the Bible. I don't like God, so I'm going to make up something else. And that's where all that comes from. And so we look at this today, and we must decide if we're going to stand with truth. And God says to us to be good soldiers. I wrote seven things down that a, a soldier does today. Brother Eddie, I'm going to have you come up on the first one. Let me say just a word about it first. And, and the first thing is, is a good soldier does is he, he perseveres. It says there that he is one that, that uh, they share in suffering as a good soldier. Uh, I like what the old King James says, they endure hardships. They endure the hardships of a good soldier. I asked Brother Eddie to come up. He was an old soldier. He said he was the, you were in the 101st, is that right, Eddie? 101st, and they, they jumped out of airplanes with parachutes. In fact, uh, Larry said they didn't do much over there. They, they, you know, y'all did all the work, and, you know, so I'm, I like getting you and Eddie involved. Yeah. <laughs> K 
Come on up, Eddie. Share us a little, just a little bit. <laughs> Share just a little bit about what, uh, what, a, what a soldier endures. What are hardships that a soldier endures? Oh, you make it hard for me. <laughs> First off, before we get started, the movie. Uh, the, the video, video, yeah. That 13 fold means a lot. I've made a lot of barrel detail, a lot of, as a Patriot Guard, as a Patriot Guard rider, I've made a lot of military fuel. Those 13 fold that you make in that flag and you give to that family, that means a lot too. Because that, they, not only did they lose a husband or a wife, they've lost their whole family. And we need to remember that. Now getting on to what the preacher's talking about, it, you endure things that you don't think you can possibly do. The first thing that you sacrifice is your family. There's a lot of men sitting here right now that has made that sacrifice. We was talking earlier this morning. I said, talk to Joe. He spent 30, 30 years, 36 years. In a, it, not a, it, it not only hurt or he, what he had to sacrifice to his family, to him too. And we, we must think of these things. Uh, some of the things that we've done that we go through to make us better soldiers. What makes us a better soldier for God? Exactly what the pastor was telling us. We have to study, learn, and live. Well, if, when you go in the military, the first thing they're going to they gonna break you down. They're going to make you what they want you. And you have to go through that. Now, it's for your benefit so you can survive. So when we get in this old book, what we call it, the old book, this is a guidance for us to survive. We don't want to go downstairs. We want to go upstairs. And that's, some of the, that's just one of the things. Now, I didn't join the military. The military joined me. I'm going to put it that way. I was drafted right out of high school. I went straight to Fort Pope. AITN boot camp. Boot camp first, which was basic training. AIT, I went to Fort Pope. Tiger Land. I knew I was going to Vietnam. I went to Vietnam. Got to Vietnam. They signed me with the 101st Airborne Division. That was the worst bunch in the world. <laughs> that's what First, Larry. That's what Larry been saying over there. Yeah. That's what Larry. That's what Larry <laughs> said. Larry was. He was over in 1965, 66 with the 25th Infantry. Well, if he finished up, why did I have to go? I didn't go to five years later. <laughs> but anyhow, they think everybody in Louisiana lives in the swamp. And I told him to look. I'm an old country boy in the hills, piney hills of North Louisiana. I don't know nothing about no swamp, but it didn't make no difference. That's where I was going. I survived every day. Some of the hardships that you could not believe. These men today are doing the same thing. It's not about us or me. It's about it's because of those who were before me did what they did. That makes a good soldier. It's before them that did what they did before him. We must remember that everything that we do, God controls, regardless if we like it or not. Today, our nation is in such turmoil that we don't know how we gonna get? But we have to remember what B Brother Matt said. He's God is still in control, and we need to remember that. Some of the things that I endured, I'm gonna just give you. I ain't telling a war story, but I'm just gonna give you some of the. Things. How would you like to go 92 days without a bath? 92 days. I ate three hot meals for a year. Now just think about that. I had my boots right off my feet. I was down to nothing but a pair of shorts 
and fighting in the jungle. Peter, this is the truth. I watch men die. I watch men cry. I watch men suffer. And when I left, thank God that I made it through it. There's not a man in here that went through the military that hadn't suffered the same thing. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about? Okay, at night. Here's one thing I went through in Vietnam. We didn't have a sleeping bag. We, uh, that would have been a luxury. We had an air mattress. We'd, we'd go, we'd lay down at night. Somebody had to be on guard all the time. I worked in a six-man team. You'd wake up the next morning on that air mattress, which was halfway blown up, keep from getting a hole in it. There'd be hundreds of worms under that thing. We called them dew worms. Big as your thumb, five foot long, like a snake, like a snake. And that was every time you woke up. Leeches. You'd wake up in the morning and the leeches would be in your mouth. So you didn't dare snore. You had a wetland leech and you had a dry land leech. The tiger leeches would be six inches long. They were in the water. The dry land leeches were just like fleas here. They eat on you all the time. But these are hardships that I went through that... I didn't like, but I had to do it to survive. We need to remember every time you see a veteran to thank them for what they've done. Regardless of what, what branch they served in. And just never forget that those who fought and died for our freedom, that we never can forget these. Amen. And that's all I got to say. Amen. <clears throat> don't be ashamed of our nation you know I may be ashamed of some of my politicians but I don't mean I have to be ashamed of my nation <laughs> and if you if these folks that don't like America want a plane ticket a one way plane ticket I think we can come up with money for one way plane tickets to get them some place wherever they think they'd be happy but um Anyway, thank you, Eddie, for sharing that. And, you know, and, and as a Christian, as a Christian, it's not always easy to serve God. There's going to be times the devil's going to get on your case and you're going to have problems like everybody else has, whether it's financial problems, health problems, whatever it may be. It's going to be hard sometimes. The Bible tells us a couple of different places. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, Don't grow weary in well-doing. Galatians 6.9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In other words, we can win if we keep on serving, keep on going, and don't quit when it gets hard. And so that's kind of the challenge here. Let's look at the second thing in your outline. Not only are we to, does a good soldier uh, persevere, uh, number two, he knows his purpose. He knows his purpose. He says the, the, the share in the sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He's a, a good soldier, somebody who knows what his plan is. He knows where he's supposed to be. He knows what mission he's on. He knows he's focused on the task in front of him. Sometimes that mission means that somebody's going that way and some group's going this way and some group's up through here and another group through there and, and there's bombs going to be falling. We all need to know what the plan is, but we need to focus on getting our job done. Could I ask you a question? What is your job in the kingdom of God? What is your job in the army of God? What are you doing? What am I doing to, what has God told you to do to serve him? To be in his army. What has God told you to do? Are you doing it? Are you fulfilling your purpose? The purpose is, Jesus said he came to seek and to save that, was lost, that which was lost. Amen? But sometimes our purpose, that's all of our purpose, to witness to the lost. That's why I got these cards up here. You can pass them out where places where you go, uh, people you meet. But, but, yeah, that's all of our mission. But some of you have other missions. You have missions like teaching a class or discipling a young believer 
uh, encouraging and ministering to someone maybe in a nursing home or in a hospital. There's a lot of ways and a lot of places where we can do the ministry, but his purpose is to win. His purpose is to overcome the enemy. Rush Limbaugh used to say, the purpose of the military is to kill people and break things. <laughs> you know, kill people and break things. That's their purpose. And you know what? That, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, but our purpose is to overcome the enemy, to defeat the enemy. I don't know about you, but when I die, and when I die, I want the devil to come to my funeral and say, whew, I just want to make sure that joker was dead. I just want to bring my stethoscope and listen, to make sure his heart wasn't thumping. I'd love to make the devil that mad. I know I probably made some liberals that mad, but I'd like to make the devil that mad. I, I, I know I probably don't, but I, I, would, I would love to. I'd fulfill my purpose if I did. Number three, he purifies his life. He says in verse four there, uh, he said, no one uh, serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of, silver, of civilian life. I think about what that means, entangles himself. Uh, if a soldier is on the battlefield, Brother Eddie, Brother Larry, if a soldier's on the battlefield and, and he's constantly thinking about what's on television or what, how well his football team's doing back home, or he's constantly thinking about whether his wife is cheating on him, and he's constantly thinking about other things and his mind's not on the battle and why he's out there, you think he's going to be effective? Is he going to be as effective? If he's constantly, his mind's just not on what he's doing. That's true with everything we do. But we need to be a people who are, uh, our, our life is focused on what we're doing. When I say purifies, I mean he doesn't allow himself to, to lose his focus. He, he doesn't allow himself to have other things to tangle him up, to slow him down, because he wants to be out there as that soldier. He wants to be free and focused on what he's doing. So I say he, he purifies, he streamlines his life. Number four, he seeks to please his commander. He says there in the last part of verse four, he says, and he seeks to please the commanding officer. How true that is. A good soldier is one who says, yes, sir, no, sir. He's there. And whatever that commander tells him to do, he doesn't say things like, I don't feel like that today. He doesn't say things like, well, I don't believe I'll do that today. I got the wrong weapon. I brought my rifle, and I needed my shotgun, you know. He doesn't do those kind of things. He just does what his commander tells him to do, and he does it to the best of his ability. That's what a good soldier does. Now, who is our commander? God's our commander, isn't he? The God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Word of God. Amen. And, and, and the Lord commands us to do certain things. He commands us to be out there where the battle is at. He commands us to put on the whole armor of God, as I talked about last week, every day, to put on that whole armor of God and get out there and, and stand against the enemy to, to make a difference in this old world, to win somebody to Christ, to overcome the enemy. And, and I, I know I'm simplifying that, but there's a lot of ways we overcome the enemy. We overcome the enemy by, by winning in temptation, by not giving in to every little temptation that comes our way. Some Christians are so weak that they fail every time the devil comes against them, they give in. They just fail. They don't have any spiritual strength to stand against the enemy. Now, we all do that sometimes. We all fail sometimes, whether it's losing our temper or uh, being dishonest about something or cheating on something, whatever it may be. We realize that we can all, we can all fall short of what we should be. But I'm here to tell you, a good soldier is going to give his best. He's not going to fail. He's, he's going to do the best he can, and that's what we ought to do. We ought to seek to please our Lord in whatever task or mission he sends us on. Number five. He's passionate about his mission. I think passion is so important. Verse 5, it, it shifts over to like someone running in a race. He says, if anyone competes as an athlete, well, think about the term competing. I'm going to tell you, you go out there and run that race, if you don't give your 100% out there, I'm sure I, I saw where Katie and, and them just, I don't know, did both of y'all run this week in the, in the 5K? You really got him to go? I can't believe Lane went. He went. He got him out of bed to go with you. Okay. But anyway, there were some others that went and did some things like that. But, but you know, to, a lot of times we just want to quit. It gets tough. It gets tough, and you get tired, and you just want to quit. But that competitor is the one who says, I want to cross the finish line, and I don't want to be the last one across the finish line. And uh, now if I got out there, I would think just getting across the finish line would be a great thing. It doesn't matter if I was 
if I was three miles behind the last one that went across that finish line, I just got finished. That was winning to me. But, uh, but for most folks, you want to get out there and compete. You want to try to get that prize, which is what is mentioned in the next part of that verse. Here's what I'm saying. A soldier is supposed to get out there, and he wants to defeat the enemy. He wants to win. And that takes passion to do that. If you go out there in a battle, and all of a sudden you don't believe and really believe in the principles of, uh, of America, let's say, and you're out there in that battle, uh, I don't remember what that guy's name was, what that little turncoat's name was that went out from in a, a few years, two or three years ago. You remember uh, Obama, uh, promote, you know, thought about how great he was? Bergdahl, yeah. Yeah, he wandered off, went over and joined the enemy. Come find out later, and they give him uh, give up a whole bunch of terrorists to get him back and all that kind of stuff. I said, I'd get him back for what? I don't even think we needed him back. But he snuck off over and joined the enemy. You know why he did that? Because he didn't really believe in America. He didn't really believe in what we stood for. We got a bunch of folks like that today. And, and you know what? They just kind of go over and just help the enemy. They don't have any passion about who we are. You know what? There's Christians that do the same thing. There's Christians that do the same thing. Instead of getting out in that battle and being passionate about Jesus Christ, my wife asked me the other day about this person and that person said, how come they don't come to church anymore? How come they're not regular in church? I said, they're not in love with Jesus. Preacher, I can't believe you said that. You hurt my feelings by saying that. You know what? When we fall deeply in love with Jesus and when we're passionate about Jesus, the preacher won't have to beg you to come to church. Just won't have to do it. That'll be a priority in your life. I mean, you won't get up on Sunday morning and say, Well, I don't know if I want to go to church or go fishing today. Well, I was thinking about playing golf today. It's such a pretty day. Or I might better stay home today. You know, two days ago, baby, I heard one of the children cough. They might be coming down with something. We better stay home. You know, it's amazing how many times, how many times, if we were just more passionate about God and the things of God, we'd be in the house of God to hear the Word of God from the man of God because we'd want to have that close relationship with God. And that's what a soldier needs. I'm going to tell you if, you, if you, if you're trying to drag people to hell, and I know about a God who loves people, and He wants to send them to heaven, and I want you to know Him. You know, someone said this the other day. I heard, I forget who said it on the radio, but they were talking about witnessing and how we get scared to death when somebody uses that term witnessing, Brother Whalen. We think, oh, my goodness, they're talking about witnessing again. They're talking about witnessing again. Plug your ears up. Plug your ears up. Don't want to hear about that. I don't want to talk to people about the Lord. That scares me. He said this. He said, don't call it witnessing. Call it recommending. That I just want to recommend someone to you. I want to recommend that you get to know Jesus. I'd like to give you a recommendation to somebody that would, could really change your life. You know, I thought about that. Maybe that's what we ought to do. Maybe we just ought to sneak around and say, well, I just want you to get out there and recommend Jesus to a bunch of people this week. If, that's what, if that makes you feel better, just go out and recommend, folks, the, to the Lord Jesus Christ this week. But be passionate about it. I'll tell you, if you're passionate about God, it'll make you spend more time in prayer. It'll make you study your Bible more. It'll make you a better soul winner. It'll make you more loving. It'll make you give a lot of recommendations if we're passionate about God. I'm here to tell you, sometimes we lose our passion, don't we? Number six. Number six, he lives for the prize. He lives to win. He wants to make a difference. It says there, uh, about that one, he's uh, how he competes. Yes, it says he he competes, but also it says for what uh, that he he is not crowned unless he competes. Uh, crowned the prize. He wants to win. He wants to make a difference. I think about that. I think about uh, Pat Tillman, who was one of the NFL football players who, when the when this war over in the Middle East broke out back in, I think it was two thousand five. He just he turned down a million dollar con multi million dollar contract, got out of the mil got out of the NFL, and went to fight 
for America. He died over there. He died over there. Uh, and what a, what a sad thought that, that he died, but, but, but a good thought that he loved America. He wanted America to win. America winning was more important than the St. Louis Cardinals winning to him. It's amazing how many people today, they're more, they're more excited about their sports team than they are about the Lord. They really are. They're more excited about this team winning or that team winning. I'm going to tell you, I about, had, I about had my belly full of all these, these athletes. Amen? I about tired of this whole bunch of athletes today. There's not many of them out there, you know, worth flipping a coin over. But uh, it, it's important that we, that we decide that, that, that we're going to be someone who doesn't just want to get out there. We want to compete. We want to make a difference. The Bible says for every one of us who are willing, who, who live for the Lord, who love His appearing, it says there's a crown for us. There's a crown of righteousness, the Bible says. And when we're saved, we get the crown of life. These are prizes that God has for us, crowns that God has for us in that day. And last of all, uh, he serves with, with principles. He says in the last of that verse 5, he says uh, how he must run that race, that he, according to the rules. There's a way to run this race. He serves, uh, he serves the way he's trained to serve. A soldier's trained. If a soldier's trained to do certain things, he's not going to get out there on the battlefield and say, hmm, I know they taught us some good things, and I don't know if they really knew what they were talking about back there. I'm going to try something new today. <laughs> you know, and then he doesn't fit into the team. And then he's out there doing his own thing, and, you know, he may wind up, you know, messing everything up. He's got to do it the way the rules say that you should do it, you know. He, he, he can't say, well, you know, they say take this gun and put the butt of that gun on your shoulder and point out there and pull the trigger. But, you know, I'm not sure that's the best way. I'm going to try turning that gun around, and I'm going to put the barrel up here, and I'm going to put that out, and I think that might work better. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and try that <laughs> if you think it will. No, there's rules. There's the way things work, and that's not the way it's done. I say that to say this. How does that fit into God? How does that fit into the things of God? Well, there's rules in the things of God, isn't it? There's rules that we follow. Now, that's the problem. That's the problem that, that Barna research I told you a while ago, about 70% of the pastors aren't too happy with all the rules. They've about decided some of those rules in the Bible they don't like. For example, this will blow your mind. Some ministers don't believe the Bible is truly the Word of God without error. Some ministers don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. There was a guy who's the head of, of Mercer University over in Georgia, Macon, Georgia, some years ago. I won't give his name or anything, but his, he wrote a book. He's the president of a Baptist university. He wrote a book, and here was the title of the book. God, if you're up there. Conversations with God, if you're up there. Ooh, what a blessing it must have been to be ministered to by Him. And so we, I, I just want you to be aware that not every book, I'm going to tell you something, not every book I pick up in a Christian bookstore would I agree with, unless it's one of these books. But not everybody that writes a book about the Bible necessarily believes all the Bible. Not every church you go to is going to believe all the Bible. I hate to tell you that. There are churches, there are churches all over this nation flying the LGBTGQSMNE3, whatever it's called. And they're, they're, they're flying the rainbow flags outside their churches saying, Woo, we support it. We're all for that. Well, you know what they're telling me? When you got that rainbow flag out there, you don't believe this. You don't believe this. Not that we shouldn't love anyone who's, who, may be, who may be into that sin in their life, but it's still sin. We have to acknowledge it is sin. But there's a lot of other sins, too, and some of those sins are heterosexual sins. They're not homosexual sins. Fornication and adultery and people living together outside of marriage and stuff. I mean, let's just be honest. That's just wrong too. Well, preacher, you, you, I was all for it when you were talking about that rainbow flag. 
you know, but then you start pointing at my sin, and I'm mad now. Well, you'll get over it after a while. Amen? You see, the church, if the church is ever going to have spiritual awakening, we're going to have to acknowledge what is sin, and we're going to have to deal with sin, and, and it begins in the house of God. It begins in the house of God. We've got to be right first. And we can't be watering things down. So in closing, yes, there's some rules. There's some rights and wrongs with God. There are. For example, one of those rules says that we're all sinners and we've all sinned. Right? Every one of us have committed sins. And every one of us need those sins to be forgiven. And there's only one way... The second rule is we have to believe that Jesus died on the cross and that if we'll place our faith in Him and ask Him to come into our life, He'll forgive those sins. And then and only then can we go to heaven. We've got to follow the Jesus road. Not just another road, not just one way, but not just pick a way and everybody's got different ways. No, there's just one way. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people standing behind the pulpit on Sunday morning don't believe that. And if you think Oprah Winfrey is, Winfrey should have been the 13th disciple, <laughs> she don't believe it. There's a lot of folks don't believe don't listen to people on TV, on the Internet, and if they don't match with the Word of God, you just stay with God's Word. So there's rules, and the, the, the Bible says there's a way we do things, and there's a way we don't do things. Not because God's trying to take all the fun away. God says, I want you to know me, and you know me my way. You don't know me your way. Okay? Do you know him? Do you know him today? Have you traveled down that road through Jesus Christ? The Bible says we should. We could. He loves you and he's got a wonderful plan for your life, but you've got to do things God's way, not your way. God's way. Would you bow with me as our musicians come this morning? As we conclude this morning, it's... I just want to remind you that God says we're to be we're to be soldiers. And what does that mean? You know, a soldier's not somebody who's just passive, who says, Well, I got this, you know, well I signed up for the military, but I don't want to touch a gun. I don't want to wear a uniform. I'm embarrassed about that. I I don't want to exercise. I think about all the training they go through. No. When you sign up to be in God's army, you're saying, God Count me in. We all, military has different types of jobs. I mean, some of them work in refueling planes, and some of them are artillery, and some of them, you know, infantry, and uh, they're doing all kinds of different things. Flying on, I mean, uh, sailing on ships, and there's all kinds of different ways they serve. And there's the same thing true for the army of God. There's all kinds of different ways we serve. But you have to serve need to be willing to serve. So as we close this morning, have you joined God's army yet? Have you been willing to honor God with your life and let Him be your commanding officer? If that's never happened in your life, you could pray a prayer, something like this. It says, just pray it with me right now. Dear Jesus, just pray it softly where you are. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. As you said, I am. And Jesus, today I want to turn from my sin. And I want you to come into my life. And I want you to be my commander. And I want to be your soldier. I, I want to be a part of your, your army of men and women. I want to be part of your family, God. And you're going to be in charge. So Jesus, forgive my sins. Save me. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. 
and rose from the dead. It's coming back for me one day. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Fill me with your spirit is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me, while we sing this song, would you be willing to get up and just come up here and stand beside me? Just come right up here and stand beside me. If you prayed that prayer with me just then, you'd never done that before, or maybe that's the first time you really meant it, come up here and stand by me. Show that you're not ashamed of what you just prayed. All right? Brother Waylon. Think about his love. Let's stand. Stand with me, folks. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. How could I forget His love? And how could I forget His goodness? He satisfied he satisfies, He satisfies my desires. Think about His love, think about His goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Amen. Thank you so much. Can you imagine how much it took for Miss Ashley to come up here and stand by me this morning and say that she prayed that prayer with me this morning? She's the wife of our youth minister here in our church. And she could have said, well, I don't know what people might think. Ashley, do you think you did what God wanted you to do this morning? I think God heard that, heard your prayer. Amen. She was just uncertain about her salvation and where she really stood with God. And she wanted to nail that down with God this morning. She prayed this prayer with me today to receive Christ and to just nail that down in her life. Ashley's had a lot of health issues the last, well, I don't know how long, but it's definitely been, seemed like ever since they started considering working with the youth ministry, the devil's been on her case. So we're going to, we've heard her decision, we know her decision, but as we conclude this morning, I want to ask a few of you ladies who who really believe in prayer, to come up here and gather around Miss Ashley and pray for her. Because I think we need to just cover her in prayer. I think the devil's doing everything he can to affect their family and to affect her health. And um, I want you ladies to pray for her. Pray for God to 
to heal her, to protect her, put a hedge of protection around her, and, and really preserve her through this, and to, and to really set her free from what the enemy's doing in her life and in her family. Okay? I'm going to have one of our, one of our ladies... Which one of you ladies would be willing to pray for her in our closing prayer? Amen. Hey, uh, as you get ready to go this, this morning, our service tonight's at 6 o'clock. Our foster daughter, our foster daughter, Rachel, who many of you know, some of you may not know, she came to live with us in 10th grade. She graduated Tech last week. And we're going to do some recognition of her tonight, nothing after church. But she's going to share her testimony tonight. And she has got one testimony. So uh, you want to come and hear that in connection with her graduation celebration tonight. So be here, be in here. Bless you guys.